I've never practiced careers guidance. <coughs> and I'm not actually a careers guidance researcher. But my relevant research field is young people's transitions from education into the labour market, which I've studied now for nearly 50 years, continuously in this country and also elsewhere. So I've been in the proximity of careers guidance throughout. I did write a book about the Youth Employment Service in 1971. <laughs> and I, I actually joined the Institute, which is now the Institute of Careers Guidance, at that time. So I must be one of the longest still surviving members of it. I mean, our careers officers have assisted me with my research among young people all over in various parts of London, Chelmsford, Midlands, North West. I was invited to the half centenary celebrations of the two colleges that started the first diploma in vocational guidance courses. That was in 1949. And I was with them both in 1999 when they were looking forward to a, a great second half centenary. As I think every international review of careers guidance from the 1970s onwards had said that Britain had the best in the world, so we were top at something. In Tony Watt said so, but other people did as well. And it was known that the need for guidance would, could only increase. Uh, young people's transitions from school to work were becoming longer and more complicated. There were more junctures when they would need advice, information, guidance. So it was kind of out of tune with history when, about 18 months ago, there, there were cries of panic and alarm, and then news of redundancies among careers guidance officers. And membership of the institute shrinking. So I'm pleased that you asked me here today because I've known about it, what is going on. And being here has forced me to sort of systematise my thoughts on how it came to this. The, the this is the situation in England, of course. I mean, Scotland and Wales have developed public sector all age careers services. And Northern Ireland, I think, will. But England, perfidious Albion, and everybody else is out of step. It has always been this. I, I, I'd also talk specifically about careers guidance for young people, because it's only for young people that in the UK we've offered career guidance on a continuous long term basis as a public service. When I was first starting out in my own research career in 1965, the Ministry of Labour was opening occupational guidance units staffed by psychologists, and they didn't last. And since then, there have been pilots offering careers guidance for adults, usually based on the service for young people, but they've never been mainstream. But this year sees the launch of a national career service. <coughs> But that is the future, and I was asked to talk about the past. Yeah. And I think that's because I have quite a lot of past. <laughs> and so I will, I, will, I, will, I will know about the past. And I'm quite willing to do that. So what I want to do is to review the history of career guidance in Britain, looking as we always do for clues <coughs> to our present situation. It wasn't me that first said that history is always made in the present, with which it is. We constantly reinterpret, rescan history. 
the clues as to how we got to where we are now, so I want to do this today. And for those who know all this stuff, you can regard it as a reinterpretation of how we got here. And for those who don't know the stuff, it is the authoritative account. <laughs> but like everybody else who's written about this, I started 1910, so this is not controversial. Before I wrote my book on the Youth Employment Service, there was an earlier one by Herbert Hagginbottom, who had been Principal and Careers Officer in Birmingham. This was written in 1951. There is a later one by David Peck, which was published in 2004, which was up to date then. <laughs> but things in recent years have come out of date more quickly than when I wrote my own book in 19, 1971. But 1910 is the Education Choice of Employment Act that creates the Juvenile Employment Service. And it's passed at the same time alongside, though in the subsequent year, to the Labour Exchanges Act of 1909. I mean, for both, the pioneering work has been done in the voluntary sector. Like a lot of parts of the welfare state, the first initiatives are by voluntary associations. And the state then embraces them, funds them, makes them available nationwide. Beginning of the century, the argument for labour exchanges was that they'd bring down the level of unemployment and hopefully get the best possible match between workers and jobs. But you can, you can see from the two acts that it was recognised from the start that the people who were then called juveniles, they needed a somewhat different service than would be offered in the labour exchanges that would cater mainly for, for un unemployed adults. So 1902 Act had created local education authorities. And the view was that advising juveniles should be a task entrusted to the local education authorities. What was required was basically educational work. There was some uncertainty at first about what the division of labour should be between the juvenile employment service operated by the LEAs and the labour exchanges operated first by Board of Trade, then Ministry of Labour when it's hived off at the time of the First World War. To, to begin with, the LEA officials are giving advice and juvenile sections of the labour exchanges are doing the placement where needed, yeah. But it's decided by all parties that that is unsatisfactory, because often the placement officials don't follow the advice that the young people have been given, scientifically, <laughs> yeah. And it's decided that one party or other should do the entire service, and the preferred party is the local education authority, who are encouraged to take everything on an advisory service for juveniles and a juvenile labour exchange service as well. And over time, more and more local education authorities do take on this task until at the end of my first period, 1973, it becomes mandatory. They have to, yeah. In the meantime, what was a juvenile employment service has become a youth employment service, 1948, reflecting the changed way in which the age group is referred to. And my first period, you can describe it as the years of the rise of careers guidance and the formation of a careers guidance profession. Now, when I was first doing research and encountering the Youth Employment Service in the 1960s, I was able to interview senior Youth Employment Officers at the time, who started their own working lives when it was a juvenile employment service, 
before the Second World War. And they were able to describe to me how they came to be in the Cuban Employment Service and what they work involved. I mean, at the time, there was no specific professional qualification. It was another job in the town hall. But, I mean, it applied to a lot of local government activities, parks, baths, libraries. It's in the 20th century that they tended to professionalize. You got employed in the juvenile employment service. It was desirable you had some personal, wider work experience. But then, if you worked good with young people, interested in young people, maybe did youth work, this could be the position for you. I mean, right from the beginning, the standard menu, the standard service offered had been more or less fixed for the next 60 years. It was the juvenile employment officers going around to schools and giving a talk to those in their final year, followed by an individual interview, and then assistance with placement if needed. And it was still so in the 1950s when researchers began to study this and concluded it was too little too late. And all the youth employment officers agreed it was too little too late. But that was the original standard menu. However, there was one of these people who had started in the juvenile employment service who explained to me that his main job before the Second World War was actually to issue national insurance cards, which now hell. In 1909, 1910, Labour exchanged the choice of employment acts. This is the great liberal governments of Campbell, Bannerman and Asquith. 1909 is also old age pensions, which are financed out of taxation, general taxation then. Yeah. 1911 is the first National Insurance Act yeah, that introduces national insurance with a special payment by employer and employee. Yeah, which is supposed to go into a separate fund that never existed, it's a virtual fund, but it's supposed to make the extra taxation more acceptable because it's linked to the payment of sickness and unemployment benefit. Now, if the state is going to pay unemployment benefits, then and still now, it must have a way of checking that the unemployed are actually unemployed and available for work. In other words, it needs labour exchanges. Yeah. So the argument for labour exchange or said the juvenile employment services might have been about reducing the level of unemployment and getting the best possible match, but the reason the government needed it then, one reason, is to introduce a national insurance scheme. Simultaneously, it's introducing sickness and unemployment benefits. And part of the job of the juvenile and then the youth employment service and then the career service is in fact to police this system in relation to juveniles. You know, until after the Second World War, national insurance, you had an actual card on which a stamp was stuck each week. But, but even when that lapsed, it became electronic. I mean, from the beginning and until the 1970s, it was the job of the juvenile that was employment service of its successor to register all school leavers with the system. And up to the mid-1970s, this gave researchers like myself our time series on types of first employment entered by school leavers. In the mid-1970s, the career service loses its role in this. And we lose our time series. And it's replaced in the early 1980s by the youth cohort surveys that are still ongoing. Yeah. <coughs> Let's register that. <coughs> we, we come back to it, come back to it later. We I mean aspirations among juvenile employment officers to make it a profession rather than just another job in the town hall. They start in the really in the early days. 
And the Institute of Curious Gardens, as it now is, I mean, it's a direct descendant from the National Association of Juvenile Employment and Welfare Officers that was created in 1922. It was not a trade union, a trade union representation is separate. It was meant to be the beginnings of the professionalization of the occupation, as indeed it was. I mean, over time, the welfare officers go separate. Welfare officers, otherwise known as truancy officers, yeah. And they go separate, and the National Association is named an institute. Sounds more professional, doesn't it? Yeah. And that's where we are today. I mean, in the 1920s, the juvenile employment officers were looking for a professional knowledge base for their work. And they identified it in occupational psychology. Oh. <laughs> but as you may know, I mean, psychologists at that time were developing their uh, tests to measure individuals' abilities. Most famously, they developed their <coughs> intelligence, IQ tests, that became widely used for education. They were also developing tests of occupational abilities, aptitudes, and interests. And the idea of the juvenile employment officers was that if they could have these tests administered to young people. And if the juvenile employment officers were trained in their interpretation, they would have a scientific basis, rather than just personal common sense experience, for issuing advice to young people. Yeah. I think there's long-term significance in this. Yeah. I mean, the sense of professionalism among the staff of the juvenile and youth employment service and career service their profession is guidance. Yeah. Though at the time, there are other things that the juvenile and youth employment service do. Offering the employment exchange service, and then this social security. I mean, there's attempts to start a professional course for juvenile employment officers from the, in the late 1930s. But it's thwarted by the Second World War. And the first course of start in 1949, the ones that <coughs> were celebrating their half centenary in 1999. And their diploma in educational guidance is obviously a successful qualification because it lasts for over 50 years. Yeah. <coughs> I doubt if the new 16 plus exams are going to last that long. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was a lot of thought given to it. They've been thinking about this from the, 19, from the 1920s. Now, around that time, the early 1950s and before the Second World War, the most influential occupational psychologist was um, Alex Roger. You have heard of this, some of you. He had a seven-point plan. <laughs> and everybody had to learn this if you were going in the, in, in the Youth Employment Service, because you... Your job was to assess occupations in terms of seven characteristics that they required, and then you assessed the young people. And then you could get round pecks into round holes, as it was said. But by, by the 1950s, the, the, the context in which the youth employment services operating is changing. And there's full employment in most parts of the country. And before the Second World War, the great risks facing juvenile school leavers were unemployment and dead-end jobs. Teagull, errand boy, messenger boy, jobs that just would not last. Go back to the 1910 period, domestic service. You know, upstairs, downstairs, and down to Abbey, don't you? I mean, that was a ma major, major form of employment for young people at the time. And by the 1950s, all that has gone. Yeah? I mean, there's still apprenticeships, and then there's other types of jobs, but not the old type of dead end job. And young people on leaving school will have a genuine choice of occupation. I know, because I left at the time. I mean, you went, you applied for a job, and you got it. 
at the time. <laughs> and it was not at all difficult. I mean, also, I mean, at the time, young people were staying in education longer. In some parts of the country in 1910, you could legally leave when you were 12. They became 14 nationwide after the 1918 Education Act. 15 after 1947. And was to become 16 in 1972. And in 2015, it will be won't it? In some form of learning. Interestingly, that was first anticipated in the 1918 Education Act. <coughs> Eventually, at least part time education for everybody until age 18. One local education authority that turned out the foolish that implemented this and made it compulsory was rugby. They thought they were first. And they discovered nobody else was behind them. <laughs> and they, they rescinded it. But nearly a century later, it seems we will get around to that. But for young people who were staying in education through 15 and more were staying beyond the minimum leaving age, I mean, the trend towards higher enrollments in post compulsory education is start to crack. It's been going on for, forever. Yeah. But there were increasing numbers in the 1950s and 1960s. I mean, it's for these young people that the, the talk, the interview, clearly is too little, too late. And the aim of youth employment officers is to start programs of careers work much earlier. Nowadays they would say preferably in primary school. And also by the 1960s, Alec Rogers is out. And young people, uh, youth employment officers are relating their practice to theories of personality development. And they're also trying to be non-directive, not telling young people this is the right job for you, yeah? but encouraging young people to clarify their own ambitions and inclinations and abilities as they move through secondary education and while they do this relate these to the world of work. <coughs> Youth employment officers are able to argue that this kind of service is relevant for all young people. I mean, until then, they've had great problems in getting into the grammar schools yeah. and the renaming of the service, the career service, is meant to give it a title which will be acceptable all round. It's also felt that careers is a better description of what the service is into, not just jobs, yeah, careers, something that's progressive. And getting into all schools is aided by the comprehensivization of secondary education that is going on at the same time. And it's here. That we have the best careers advisory service in the world. Yeah. I mean, it's professional. The staff have a professional qualification. They are properly qualified. Since the Second World War, more and more of them have become university graduates, though all of them continuously, preferably with wider occupational experience. It's an educational service. The young people are the clients, and they're impartial, they're independent of all educational institutions. They have an impartial position. They are not working for any employers, they are not working for industry, they are working for young people. The best in the world. And my second period though, I mean it was unexpected in the 1960s. Because when I was a student and I did study economics as well as sociology, the economics professors told us that mass unemployment would never return. Because Keynes had shown how it was unnecessary and therefore no government would let it happen again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it seems surprising now that it took us a long time to realise throughout the 1970s that the disappearance of young people's jobs was permanent. I mean, throughout the 1970s this was regarded as a temporary problem. 
and the jobs would come back once the economy was sorted. In the 1970s was a turbulent economic period. At the beginning of the decade, the world price of oil doubled and doubled again. There was a spike in prices. Trade unions tried to keep their members' earnings ahead of the increases in prices. There were bitter industrial disputes. Best recalled the coal miners' strike of the winter of 1973 to 4. And then at the end of the decade, there's a winter of discontent with local authority workers trying to smash a government imposed pay ceiling and lots of disputes in between. And in between, price inflation peaks at 26%, and unemployment goes through the million barrier and then keeps going up. And youth unemployment rises especially steeply. But the first national programme to deal with youth unemployment was the Youth Opportunities Programme that began in 1978. And it was introduced as a temporary measure. The legislation allowed it to run for only five years. Yeah. After that it would be unnecessary, the economy would be sorted. And it seems quaint. I mean, at employers' insistence in 1978, young people had to serve six weeks qualifying as registered unemployed before they could be allowed on the programme. It did not have to be, 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 be a soft option. And young people had to be available for employment throughout their six months on the programme, should jobs become available. Of course, the disappearance of young people's jobs wasn't temporary. But it's really only the 1980s that we learn this new language about economic restructuring and deindustrialization and how we're entering an information age. And the future belongs to a knowledge economy. And young people are needed to be, need to become better educated, more trained and more qualified yeah, than in the past to keep pace with the way in which the economy is heading. So, end of Youth Opportunities Programme in 1983, it isn't the jobs are back. It's first version of a youth training scheme which is meant to be permanent, it's then a one-year scheme, and that doesn't do the job, and it's relaunched as a two-year scheme in 1986. And the cry of young people who are visiting their careers office at this time is that they've got no jobs, they just try to put you on a scheme. Oh dear. I mean, by the end of the 1980s, really, there ain't any many young people who are expecting to get a job at 16. I mean, the choice is between a training scheme or post-compulsory education, academic course or an old or new vocational course. And by the end of the 1980s, these schemes have a tattered reputation and numbers opting for schemes is in steep decline and enrolments in post-compulsory education are increasing. The career service, as it's become titled in 1973, it gets additional staff to cope with this increased workload. And I think these, these years are significant for the development of the career guidance profession. 